Hey everyone, my name is Alex Jones. I am the CEO and co-founder of Hallow, which is a Catholic meditation and contemplative prayer app. I am super humbled to be able to be a part of this journey with you all. Um, and today I'm, I'm just gonna talk about my own experience uh, coming back to the faith and my own struggles with the Eucharist um, and a couple of fun stories that, that uh, tie, into, tie into all of that. If you had asked me um, 10 years ago, and forgive me, there's a train that comes by every once in a while. But if you had asked me 10 years ago what I thought about Catholics, I would have <laughs> said, I think they're pretty out there. Um, I don't know everything about what they believe. I was raised Catholic, but you know, I know that they think there's this God who created the world, which is crazy enough to start with, but then he became a baby boy um, and then he died and rose from the dead a lot of stuff happened in between and uh, all that's pretty insane and then his um, mom assumed into heaven or something um, priests apparently like your local priest can do something that can forgive uh, your most grave sin all this stuff, but the, the craziest one to me was always this thing about the bread. And that how at every Mass, every Sunday and every time Mass is celebrated, this piece of bread turns into the body of God. It's like, okay, yeah, okay, maybe it's just this symbol um, where, you know, before Jesus died, he said, hey, do this in memory of me, break this bread off in memory of me. But no, my Catholic friends would tell me, uh, it's actually the body, it's actually the flesh of God. I was like, that, this, this is just nonsense, that doesn't make any sense. I, I told you already, but I, I was raised Catholic and I had never really engaged with my faith in any meaningful way, except for my mom, who was a saint, uh, dragging me to Mass every Sunday and, and through the sacraments. But I very quickly fell away from my faith in high school and college, was a dark time for a number of reasons, did a lot of stuff that I'm not proud of. But when I graduated college, was really focused on, okay, now I'm supposed to be an adult, I should try to figure out what I believe. And so I, I tried all this theology stuff, and so I tried to figure it out. It was like a math problem that I could solve. And so I started reading C.S. Lewis, who I loved, and G.K. Chesterton, and a handful of other, actually Michael Himes has a really great book called Doing the Truth in Love. Um, so I was reading all this theology. Uh, but at the same time, I would, I would uh, read kind of the New Atheists, the uh, Sam Harris or Richard Dawkins, and I'd be convinced. It, it kind of just depended on who I, it depended on who I read last. Uh, I'd, I'd be convinced they, they were all above me in terms of what they were arguing. And so I was just, it, it felt like I was just being convinced by whoever was smarter. And so I was like, okay, well, maybe I can't figure it out that way. And in parallel to all of this, there was this strange thing going on with meditation, where I was, I was fascinated by this idea of meditation. And unfortunately, don't get me started on uh, why this is, but... Unfortunately, whenever I would think of meditation, and most people in our generation think of meditation, they think of like secular mindfulness meditation and yoga or Eastern traditions. And so I, I, I started using one of the secular mindfulness meditation apps, Headspace and Calm, I, I use them both. And I thought it was this great tool, like it was really helpful. I didn't have to go on a two week retreat, um, but I could just practice this technique or learn this technique um, at home, just 10 minutes, plug in my headphones and press play and somebody would be there to guide me through it. So I thought the app itself was really cool, but the strangest thing started happening, which is whenever I would just sit down and be quiet, my mind would be pulled towards something spiritual. And it was, uh, it was so unexpected because I still would have considered myself agnostic at the point. But it was just like any time I stopped thinking about all the to-dos and worries and stresses of my life, my mind would be pulled towards something Trinitarian, um, Christ, the cross, uh, 
know, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, whatever it was. And so we started reaching out to priests, brothers and sisters, um, monks, friends, and just saying, hey, look, we, we're, is there any intersection between this whole meditation thing and this whole faith thing? And uh, everybody pretty much laughed at me and said, yeah, we've been doing it for 2,000 years. It's called prayer. You should probably try it. And, you know, my first reaction was, you know, I've, I've done that whole prayer thing. That's not the answer. I, I know the Our Father. I know the Hail Mary. I know Hail Marys. I've tried the, hey, thanks for stuff. Sorry for stuff. Help me with stuff. That doesn't really get at what I'm talking about. It That just feels like I'm repeating things or just going through the motions. There's not really, I'm not really building a relationship there. And I didn't, uh, that all of those prayers are deeply beautiful in their own way, but I didn't understand the power of the words at all. But I was struggling. It just felt like I was just talking to myself um, or just journaling in my own head. And a, a priest said to me, he said, Alex, let, you're married, right? Which I, I, I am married. Um, don't deserve my wife, but um, that's for another time. But he said, imagine every day you came home to your wife and you said, hey, honey, I'm sorry about these things I did. I'm thankful for these things. And these are the three things I need. Um, how healthy would that relationship be? How happy do you think your wife would be? And how close do you think you'd be? And <laughs> I laughed because he must know my wife. Uh, but I was like, yeah, that wouldn't work very well. And he was like, why? And I was like, well, probably 80% of the conversation I spend listening. Hey, honey, how was your day? And share with me what's going on. And he was like, yeah, now imagine instead of coming home to your wife, you were talking to the man that created the universe. Wouldn't you want to listen even more so then? And I was like, you know, you're right. And he was like, look, prayer is, it's really important to share what's on your heart. Yes. Um, and to have a real honest conversation with God. But it's also important to listen and to learn to listen and to sit in silence with God. And it's something that I honestly had never thought about. So I started, I started learning about all these techniques of contemplative and meditative prayer, Lexio Divina and Benedictine spirituality, recollection and Carmelite spirituality, the Examine and Ignatian spirituality, uh, chant, all these things that honestly I'd never heard about. And I sat down one day and did a Lexio Divina session, which is meditating with scripture and really tried to listen. What you do is you, you try to pick a word or phrase that sticks out to you and, and try to let that sink in and Try to listen for what God or the Holy Spirit is, is trying to move within you and say to you through that passage. And the passage was the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and the word hallow stuck out. But I just, I remember sitting there and I just, I, I just broke down in tears. It was this beautiful combination of this sense of peace, like this deep peace um, that you get from sitting in, in stillness but combined with this deep sense of purpose and a real relationship and, and a real two-sided conversation. It was like, Hala, what does that mean to make holy? What am I, am I supposed to be making God's name holy? Is he supposed to be making me holy? Am I supposed to be helping other people grow in holiness? Um, how am I letting God make me holy? Which, you know, are usually big, stressful questions. Um, but it was combined with this deep sense of peace. And so it, it honestly changed my life. And it's, you know, how is the idea of, hey, if Headspace and Calm can help people learn these secular or Eastern techniques of meditation, why can't the same thing be done with Catholic contemplative prayer uh, and, and meditation? But that was, it was just, it was just the beginning of the journey. And I really started to build a deep relationship with God, rediscover the, the beauty of confession and all the truths of the church. But the last one, that I was really struggling with, it always came back to the Eucharist. And I decided, hey, okay, look, I, I tried this whole, like, I'll figure it out for myself thing, but why don't, why don't I try listening? And I went to John 6, and I just tried listening for what God was saying. And it was fascinating. And I read, had a bunch of people have spoke much more eloquently on this topic than I have, but... Christ, it, it's not like he doesn't pretend like this is a big thing. Like, like this is really hard for us to understand. And it's this momentous thing in, in his ministry. It's this central point where, you know, he has everybody gathered and he says, hey, I am the bread of life. Unless you eat of my body and, 
and drink of my blood, uh, you have no life. And they say, whoa, 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 whoa. Just like I would say, whoa, 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 what are you talking about, man? And forgive my interpretation, modern day interpretation of the gospel, but whoa, what, what are you talking about, man? Um, and he says, look, I'm, it, usually he pivots and he jumps from parable to parable. But in this sense, he, he doubles down. He says, no, look, I am the bread of life. Unless you eat of my body, you have no life. And if you do, then you will live forever. And they say, what? This is crazy. We can't eat you. You're just a, you're, you're a man right here. We can't, what are we supposed to do? Carve up your body and eat it when you die? Is that, I don't understand this at all. And people start leaving, which like, you don't really, and almost everybody leaves. And, and you don't really think about how big of a deal that is. And with this whole hallow thing, we've been incredibly blessed and fortunate to have a, a ton of people sign up for the app and start using it every day. But I could only imagine saying something or doing something and having almost everyone, except for like the core 12 people leave and stop using the app, I'd, I'd be heartbroken. I think this is the end, this is, it's, it's totally over. There's, there's almost nothing I could do that would cause it to die in that way and, and not kind of try to double back and change what I said. But he doesn't, he says, look, this is, I'm, I'm, I am the bread of life. Unless you eat of my body, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no life. And people leave. And thank God, Peter stays and the disciples stay and Jesus looks at them and says, what are you gonna leave too? What about you? And Peter says, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Essentially saying what I would have said in, in the moment, uh, hopefully by the grace of God. But look, man, I don't know what you're talking about, but I believe you and I trust you. And it's kind of that, it was that same journey for me. I, I was wrestling with the passage and I was like, look, I honestly have no idea how this could be true. How this little piece of bread could turn into you at every mass. But... I know you now, and I've built a relationship with you now, and I trust you, and I can take that leap. I, you know, if you say it's, if you say that's what's happening, then I, I believe you. And it, it was, it was this funny little jump to, hey, actually, stop and listen, uh, and take that little leap to trusting him. And then the funny thing that started happening is everything actually started to make a little bit more sense, which was, you know, you you make the leap of faith, and then the reason kind of comes second at least for me, but it, it was this, I started thinking, you know, what is really the hard, the hardest thing to understand about the Eucharist? And there were kind of two, two big things that stuck out to me. The one was, well, he obviously, like the individual act, he takes this piece of bread and uh, changes it into his body, but it still looks and, and smells and tastes like bread, but it's his body. It's like, well, that doesn't mean that doesn't make any sense. And then the other thing is, he does it for everyone at every mass, and uh, it can multiply it across as many people as he needs to. And I was, you know, I was obsessed with this John six for the for the reason where he talks about this, um, you know, I am the bread of life stuff at the end of John six. But I never really thought about what comes before it. And so one day I opened up. Um, the Bible, and I thought, you know, what are the things that come, because it's only the last kind of third of John 6 that he talks about that. What are the things that come before? And there's two miracles, which I thought were um, were super interesting. The first one is the feeding of the 5,000. And he takes the five loaves and the two fish, and he makes enough for 5,000 people. And, you know, he's essentially saying there, my second objection, or my second question, which is, Look, you, I can make as much as is necessary. You give me just a little bit and I can make enough for everybody. So it's like, okay, don't worry about that whole, hey, how do you make enough bread for everybody at mass type of thing? I got that. Trust me, I've already proven that with this miracle. And if you believed me here, then, then you can believe me on this. But then it was, okay, well, what about that? What about that first piece, that changing of the bread into something else? While it still smells and tastes and looks, all outward appearances still, still seem the same. And then, it, then I started meditating on, on kind of that, that second miracle, which the second miracle right after in John 6, which it's crazy that both of these are, are in the same chapter. I guess it's not crazy. Uh, it's divinely inspired, but it blew my mind, which was 
Jesus walking on water. And at first that doesn't really have a, a great connection. He just walks on water. It's a really cool miracle, but it doesn't really have a connection to the Eucharist. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought how strange it was that he doesn't change either himself or the water. It's not like he froze the water and then walked out or turned it into concrete and then walked out or hovered above the water or like he floated. He was still a man. He was still a human person. And the water was still water, but he walked on it. Something changed. We don't know what, but something changed. There was, it was still, it still looked, uh, I'm sure tasted, felt like water. And he was still a man, still felt and looked like a human man. But something about it was different. He was walking on water. And in the miracle, in that miracle, he shows, look, that I have power over nature. And these things that, that you couldn't possibly try to understand, I can change. While making it, keeping it looking and tasting and smelling and feeling all the same. It was like, wow, that is, it's definitely not the same thing that he does with the Eucharist. But it's, it's, it's proving, hey, look, I have power over this. Things you thought were impossible are actually possible with me. It's not possible for you to be a man and water to stay water and for you to walk on it but it's possible through me. And the same thing is possible with the bread. It's not possible for you to look at a piece of bread and have it change into God, obviously, except through me. It was just like, wow, the, the, the reason, as soon as I started, I sat down and started listening to what God was saying and let him lead the way. Uh, I mean, it, it just completely changed my life. And so I've been an enormous fan of uh, the Eucharist, of course, and with adoration. I'll tell one one story about uh, how tactically helpful the Eucharist has been to me. But when we when we started Hallow, we, you know, I was really struggling because I really liked this idea, um, but we needed somebody. And I was on the phone with somebody. We, I was walking into Mass, and I was on the phone with one of the folks who was helping to to start uh, the app, and. I was saying, look, what we really need is somebody with a super soothing voice. Like, it's really important, the quality of the voice, when if you're going to have somebody leading you through prayer, you want it to be peaceful. But at the same time, like, they've got to believe what they're saying, and they've got to help us write the content. They've got to be somebody who I could look to as a spiritual director and mentor. And I was just struggling, like, man, we just got to find somebody like that. And I went into Mass, and it was just a normal Mass, me and my wife. And I went up and I received the Eucharist and I went back and I knelt down and there's really no other way to say this, but one name popped into my head and it was uh, uh, Francis, not Pope Francis, but it was this guy I had met only once or twice in college. But strangely, his name popped into my head and, and instantly I was like, you know what, that guy, I do remember, he, I only spoke to him a handful of times, but he, he has this super soothing voice and he's somebody who I would look to as a spiritual mentor and spiritual director. And so I, we, we left Mass and I, I texted a friend and um, said, hey, I, I know you know Francis Joe who helps with our team. Hey, I know you know Francis. Could you reach out and see if you might be interested in this? I don't even have to pitch him. Francis calls me and said, Alex, I'm 150% into this. I don't have to do any work. And I was like, man, if... <laughs> If there's anything more tangible than that, that the Eucharist and that God could do for me, um, I can't, I couldn't possibly think of it. And so we owe all of Hallow and all of the um, amazing experience that we've been able to have to, to God through the Eucharist. And I, over the last few months with the quarantine, it's been hard for us all with churches closed. Um, not being able to receive the physical sacrament. And honestly, one of the few things that's gotten me through it, I, I, at my church, we'd been doing this thing for the last 30 to, to 40 years, I think, which was nonstop 24 hour adoration. And it's beautiful, it's this little church in California. And uh, one of the volunteers came to me and said, hey, you know, a handful of people we're, we're doing incredible social distancing, only having one person in the church at a time, but some of the folks who had taken the midnight shift uh, are older and so don't feel as safe doing the midnight shift in the church. 
I said, you know, I'm happy to do it. And so I, every Friday from 1 to 3, it would just be me, 1 to 3 a.m., it would just be me alone in the church with the Blessed Sacrament. And I can't tell you, it was, it was just the most peaceful experience of my life and also the most trying, like it, it really pushed me and it, it really brought me back to that first experience, that combination of peace and a deep sense of feeling loved with purpose and what am I supposed to do and I'm sorry for my sins and all my failures and um, just this deep sense of, of meaning combined with this deep sense of peace and love. And I guess the way that I, the way that I describe my faith to people now or my faith journey is like, look, if you asked me 10 years ago, if I believed in God, I probably would have told you, like, I don't really think about it that much. If you asked me seven years ago, I probably would have said, um, you know, I don't know, but probably not. Yeah, I, if I had to choose, I'd, I'd probably call myself an atheist. And if you asked me three years ago, I would have said, um, you know, I can see the arguments for both sides, but honestly, I don't know. I, I'm convinced either way. But if you asked me now, I'd say, look, I, there's always doubt. Um, I'm sure somebody super intelligent could convince me of anything. But convincing me that God doesn't exist would be the same bar as convincing me that my wife doesn't exist. Because I have... Uh, I've been incredibly blessed to have a real relationship with this guy, and I spend every Friday night with him. And I feel his love and his peace, and we have a conversation, and he pushes me, and I stare at him, and I look at him. So anyway, that's, that's been my journey. Um, uh, that This is just a, a, a plug at the end, um, but if you're interested in trying some of those uh, listening heavy prayers, the contemplative prayer, meditative prayer techniques, you can download Hallow, which is H-A-L-L-O-W, uh, just like Hallowed Be Thy Name, uh, on either of the app stores, you just type in Hallow to the app store. Sorry for the shameless plug. Um, it's been a true blessing to be able to be a part of this journey with you. Uh, thanks so much. Please reach out if you if you have any questions. God bless.